Professor Max Paul Friedman, author of Rethinking Anti-Americanism. Why do they hate us? Well, that's a good question, and Americans have been asking that at least since 1899, as I discovered uh, by looking at uh, old copies of the New York Times. We asked it throughout the 20th century. And as it turns out, first of all, they don't hate us if we think about uh, world opinion. The United States, in fact, since we've had the advent of scientific polling in the 1920s and 30s, in almost every country on the planet, at almost any point in time, the United States was more popular than unpopular. Americans were much more liked than disliked. And as it turns out, when you dig into the question, you discover there's a very small fringe of various political movements in history that have really seethed with hatred for the United States. But in fact, we are much more popular uh, around the world uh, than we believe. And that's part of the myth of anti-Americanism. Who are some of the they's? Well, again, it depends on who's asking the question. Um, if we think about the contemporary context, Al-Qaeda, for example, uh, seems to have many members who are quite angry at the United States for an array of reasons that they have and who wish it ill. But uh, what I found is that very often in, in, in the United States, our discussion about world opinion very, sort of rapidly slides into this sense that the they's include foreigners in general. The world hates us into incoherence, uh, to quote a Washington journalist uh, shortly after 9-11. During the run-up to the Iraq war, there was a sense that the whole world was turning against us inexplicably when there was the largest coordinated demonstration in the history of humankind in February 2003 against the looming war with Iraq. Uh, some estimated 15 million people on every continent, including Antarctica, at a weather station, demonstrated against the war. And Americans reacted to that by saying, they must hate us, the world hates us, and they hate us because we are good. They hate us for our freedom. Well, in fact, it turns out that's not a very helpful way of understanding foreign behavior. And this concept of anti-Americanism so often serves as a wall between ourselves and a better understanding of the complexity of the world that I decided to look into its history and discovered it goes back 200 years. Why 1899? What's significant about 1899? Well, in that year, um, there, was, uh, so there were a number of critical books printed about the uh, rise of U.S. industrial power and how it posed a challenge to European trade. And in a number of European countries, there was uh, a debate in the political realm over how to ensure that the uh, rising challenge of this new world power wouldn't take over the markets that Europeans thought were essential for themselves. Now, that's a, a, a dispute about material concerns. But Americans read it as the world is coming to hate us. And they hate us because we are so successful, because we are uh, a wealthy country, because we are free, because we stand for good, which sounds rather curious if you think about it. And nonetheless, that's been a predominant way that Americans have engaged with the world when we encounter hostility or a lack of cooperation. Are there any countries that you think are legitimately anti-American? No, not entire countries. At the moment, we have an ongoing dispute with Iran, right, with the Iranian government, which uh, itself produces uh, all manner of vicious propaganda against the United States, uh, we're written about as the great Satan and so forth. But among Iranians, we're actually quite popular. Um, they are among the most, if you want to use these terms, pro-American populations uh, in the greater Middle East. It's unusual to find, in fact, pollsters have not been able to find populations that are filled with haters of America in any country. What you do find is you find the rise and fall of approval of U.S. policies, which can sometimes erupt in demonstrations or lead to disputes between governments that we then throw into this sort of catch-all uh, category of anti-Americanism as though what's, what's, uh, what, what the problem is is this underlying hatred, even though public opinion changes radically from month to month and year to year. One example, uh, uh, Germans were asked about their opinion of the U.S. president. Under George W. Bush, it fell to a low of 12% approval. Within a couple of years, Obama was elected. Approval for the U.S. president was 92%. Well, is that a population of haters? No, it's people who can make uh, discriminating judgments on the basis of how, how they assess the new leader of the same country. And uh, many Western Europeans and people in other places were unhappy with a leader that they saw as rather an inarticulate proponent of unilateral U.S. action, 
uh, who seemed to have a swagger in his step and who didn't seem to be much interested in their opinions. And when that president left office and a new president came in who seemed to be very good at articulating why it was in the U.S. interests to behave multilaterally, to seek cooperation with other countries and so forth, um, and who also embodied a set of ideals that people like about America, like uh, the, the, the United States is a land of opportunity where anything is possible. All of a sudden, the United States was very popular. So there isn't a deep and underlying and, uh, and consistent hatred of the United States. That's actually quite rare. Uh, what we find is that foreigners are able to make uh, distinguishing judgments about different aspects of the United States and behave accordingly. Why should we care what Germans think of us? I mean, when's the last time we got asked what we thought of Angela Merkel? Well, actually, uh, many in Germany are quite interested in American opinion. Um, and, the, uh, and this is true in many countries because the United but States- why? I beg your pardon? But why? Why do they care? Mm -hmm. Well, partly because the United States has a lot of power and resources. And uh, when, when, uh, uh, when, when we get a cold, they get pneumonia, economically speaking. Um, uh, when we decide to use uh, our tremendously powerful military machine, that can affect people around the world. Uh, the United States is, uh, it, it looms very large and for good reasons in the minds of, uh, of many people around the world. It's one reason there's a lot of attention to us. But the reason why we should care is uh, it, it, not, not, it, it's not so much about whether we should treat those foreigners well. That's not the issue. Let's just talk in terms of American interests. How can we best achieve our goals? By acting unilaterally, and who cares what they think? Or by trying to use multilateral institutions and coalitions of uh, different countries as force multipliers in order to ensure that we'll have some help in pursuing our goals and that the policies we decide upon are well thought through. I'll tell you why I wrote this book. In 2002, late 2002, during the dispute over the run-up to the Iraq War, the president of France, Jacques Chirac, urged Americans not to go to war in Iraq. He said, don't go there. He said, we know the terrain. I fought in Algeria, he said. This is going to end badly. You'll be seen as a Western ar army of occupation. You'll awaken Arab nationalism. This will not be in your interest. And so what did we do? Well, we said, oh, those French, they're anti-American. Uh, they resent that their star is falling while ours is on the rise. And so we poured French wine into the gutter and boycotted French goods and burned French flags and famously renamed French fries as Freedom Fries. Member of Congress gave a speech saying, we should dig up our boys from the fields of Normandy and bring them home because French soil is no longer a fit resting place for American heroes. And as there were demonstrations against the coming war in Iraq around the world, we said, what is this wave of anti-Americanism? And as I listened to that, I thought, that reminds me of something. It reminded me of the early 60s when the president of France, Charles de Gaulle, told the American, the Kennedy administration, don't go to war in Vietnam. We've been there. We know the terrain. Vietnam had been a French colony before uh, in, in Indochina. He said, this will end badly. You'll be seen as a Western army of occupation. He told Kennedy, you're going to sink step by step into a quagmire from which you'll have trouble extricating yourselves. He predicted the war would last 10 years and end in American defeat. He said, this will be bad for the United States and bad for the West. So what did we do? We launched a boycott of French goods. We burned French flags. We poured French wine down the drain. A member of Congress gave a speech saying we should dig up our boys from the fields of Normandy and bring them home because French soil is no longer a fit resting place for American heroes. We said de Gaulle is an anti-American. The French, they're anti-Americans. And as there were demonstrations in countries around the world against the war in Vietnam, we said this is a wave of anti-Americanism. And in each case, what did we do? We ignored foreign opinion. We said the problem is they're anti-American, they're irrational, and we marched off into the two foreign policy debacles of the 20th and early 21st century. Well, there's a problem there. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense who orchestrated the escalation of the war in Vietnam, 30 years later uh, spoke of his regret that we hadn't been able to listen to de Gaulle. He said it was a failure of the imagination to realize that the French were the best informed Westerners on Vietnam, and we didn't take them seriously because we assumed that they just have it in for us. Well, uh, as the book recounts, I went to the records of that event. I went to the French archives to look at what de Gaulle's advisors were telling him, what was going on in the French foreign ministry. And they weren't writing those Americans, they have no culture and they're insignificant. And we were, what they said was uh, they analyzed the intelligence they were getting from Vietnam. There were 17,000 French citizens there. 
French exiles were, sorry, Vietnamese exiles were concentrated in Paris. They had a lot of good information, and they tried to share it with us. They tried to help. 